This is an example of a grassy plant. Narrow leaves, a lot of branches, we call them tillers. They come just below the soil surface. The growing point in every grassy plant from a point just below the soil surface. So if you try to come and mow this plant and the purpose to kill the plant, you're not gonna kill that plant because the growing point is under the soil surface. Everybody knows when you mow the grass, it will come back again. So if you wanna kill this plant, you need to dig it just below the soil surface. Now the other thing, if you wanna put a herbicide to kill this plant, you know where the growing point is under the soil surface. If you spray it on top and this herbicide does not translocate in the root system, you know what's happened. You burn the top, the plant will grow again. So if you want to use a herbicide to kill the grasses, you need to have a translocated herbicide or if you use contact herbicide, you need to cover the plant and saturate it with the chemical. The weeds that are tough to control are perennial plants. This is an example of a perennial plant, field bindweed. Now the reason why they are tough to control because they are produced, reproduced by several means. They produce large number of seeds, they have vegetative uh, uh, growing parts under the soil surface, and they have a huge reserve carbohydrate under the soil surface. And if you want to get rid of this weed, you need to deplete the carbohydrate under the soil surface. Also, if you want to use a chemical, a herbicide, you need to move that herbicide to the root system or under the ground parts. Now, if you take a perennial plant, things like field bindweed or thistle, and look at the reserve in the rhizome or in the root. What you have during winter time is the maximum reserve in the root or rhizomes. Then in the spring, when the weeds start to grow, it's gonna depend on the sugar and carbohydrate in the root system. So the sugar and carbohydrate start to move to the new growth and the plant will depend on that sugar until the plant develop enough vegetation that it can synthesize its own sugar and the excess amount that can send it back to the root. And when that happened, that happened early in the summer. At early in the summer, what the plant will do will move the sugar and the carbohydrate back to the rhizome or the root and accumulate it in enough quantity for the winter time so the plant can go over winter. Now, where do you do the cultivation for perennial plant? You do it at the lowest level of carbohydrate reserve because at that point the plant is weak and you can attack it. In this segment we discussed the vegetative reproductive structures found in perennials and why that makes them so very difficult to control. We also talked about understanding the timing of carbohydrate or sugar movement in perennial weeds and how critical it is to the proper timing for management. I am Albert Fisher. I am a weed scientist with the uh, weed group in the plant science department. I work mostly in rice environments and I have to deal with many types of weeds. What we're going to describe today are some structures of typical of perennial weeds. And perennial weeds can disperse by seed, but they very importantly have asexual means of reproduction and storage of reserves. And that's some examples of that is what we're going to see today. This is Bermuda grass, a Cynodon dactylon, a very important perennial grass, and it has two types of structures which are horizontal stems. Some of those go above ground and we call them stolons, and they have nodes, and from the nodes you can get new roots and new shoots and you can create even independent plants. So these spread laterally, and the same thing for other types of stems which are underground, and they're called rhizomes. And the rhizomes are also good for accumulating reserves. As you see here, you have a thickening of the stem, of the underground stem. This is another perennial grass, which is Johnson grass, that also has rhizomes. And you can see the thickness of the rhizome gives you an idea of the capacity to accumulate reserves. 
This is nut sedge. You'll see that in the garden, in empty lots, in crops. The nut sedges have a typical um, reproductive structure, which is the tubers. They can produce seed. Yellow nut sedge can produce seeds. Purple nut sedge produces seed, but it's mostly non-viable. The dispersal uh, structures are these tubers, which are thickenings at the end of a rhizome where reserves are accumulated, there are buds that can sprout and produce you a new plant and that can be then separated from the mother plant and can be dispersed. When you find chains of tubers, that's purple nutsage and you see how the tuber serves to accumulate reserves. This is a sorrel, uh, Oxalis corimbosa. It's not so much uh, popular here in California but you will see it in the, in the south. And there is another different structure similar to the tuber, but this is a bulb. As a matter of fact, this bulb has uh, several smaller bulbs inside. And the bulbs are like an onion. It's a shortened stem with uh, leaves, scale-like leaves, which accumulate reserves. So this is a, uh, each uh, bulb has different smaller bulblets inside that can, once the bulb breaks, these little bulblets can disperse almost like seed. Again, you accumulate reserve and you are sprouting a new plant every season or a new shoot from an older established plant and you can also disperse. This is the last type that I'm going to show today. You can see uh, this is curly dock. It's very, um, very common in fields where we don't do much tillage. This can be uh, easily uh, grazed by cattle but they pull the leaves and they never pull the plant and the reason they don't pull the plant is because of this very strong underground structure uh, which is full of reserves enabling the plant to sprout we can see the accumulated reserves this plant will not spread uh, it will re-sprout from from buds in the crown whenever the plant is injured or sectioned but this is more of a local phenomenon so this plant uh, is what we call a simple perennial, which the perennating structure is for local regeneration and resprouting. These are examples of creeping perennials. They spread out with these rhizomes and tubers and stolons. But there is a dynamic in these reserves. Normally, towards the end of the season, there is a flow of carbohydrates from the green tissues into the underground structures to accumulate reserves so that the plant can re-sprout during the next season. This seasonal cycle of accumulation of reserves is very important to ensure the survival and the ability of the plant to regenerate. Many perennial reproductive structures were discussed and illustrated in this segment, including taproots, crown roots, and bulbs, which are locally produced and also rhizomes, stolons, and tubers, which are considered to be creeping systems.